From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. It has been a turbulent year for the banking industry. Consumer confidence was jolted with the collapse of First Republic and Silicon Valley banks, and lenders are feeling the pressure of high interest rates and an unstable real estate market. What is the view from this region's largest financial institution? Our guest on this week's Newsmakers, the chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group, Bruce Van Son. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi, Bruce Van Son, Chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group. Good to have you on the program. My pleasure to be here. So as you heard in the open there, it's been a wild year, I guess to put it mildly, in the banking industry. We'll get into specifics in a bit, but just want you to give us a 30,000-foot view from your perspective. Do you feel like things have settled down a bit, or is there still turbulence that most people aren't, aren't seeing or aren't aware of? Yeah, I'd say things have settled down a fair amount. Uh, so right after the first two banks failed in March, uh, lots of turbulence and turmoil, uh, and then it started to die down. And then First Republic failed in April. Uh, so I think you know there was concern about deposit bases of the banks. Were mm -hmm. they losing deposits uh, to the big banks or to money funds? Uh, and did they have enough capital to absorb uh, the kind of impact from the higher rates if they were forced to sell their securities portfolios. But uh, <clears throat> I'd say as time's gone by, uh, most banks now have seen much less deposit flight. Uh, so deposit funding has stabilized. Banks are being cautious on lending because we're still in a treacherous environment to some extent. Uh, potentially a, a slowdown or recession could be in the offing in the next few quarters. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'd say most traditional banks have navigated this reasonably well. Uh, they're kind of built to be diverse and to manage their balance sheets well. And I'd say the bank failures, if you put a kind of envelope around those three banks, they had very idiosyncratic business models. They grew very fast. They weren't very diversified. And so what's kind of... Uh, frustrating a little bit to the well-run banks is people say this is a regional bank crisis where it really was a failure of three idiosyncratic banks. So um, we'll so. add a new category of idiosyncratic bank in that, but, <laughs> but that, is, that was one of my questions. I mean, um, going back to spring, uh, one of the, you sort of touched on it, uh, many banks, regional, regional mid-sized banks saw depositors pull their money out and maybe go to a larger bank like a J.P. Morgan Chase or something like that. What did you see at, at Citizens? Did you see people uh, pulling out, moving on, or was it sort well, of... The, the, the good news is that, that we're seen as a, as a reasonably safe bank. Mm -hmm. So we have one of the stronger capital ratios among the regional banks. We have 68% of our deposits come from consumers, and that's more stable funding than wholesale and commercial funding. So uh, we actually uh, saw a fair amount of ins and outs in the initial phase. So some people were uh, moving to uh, diversify away from us, but other people were diversifying back into us. So for the month of March, our deposits were pretty stable. Uh, but then uh, in the second quarter, we've actually uh, seen deposits increase. Uh, so, so we feel uh, pretty good about uh, where we sit at this point in terms of maintaining a very solid liquidity and funding position. People who know citizens in this region think of Citizens Bank, the green sign, but you also have Citizens Access, the online bank, which offers um, aggressive interest rates. They have a 4.5% right now, which is one of the higher rates, I think, in the country right now. Did you have to, or did you decide strategically you wanted to offer a very aggressive rate online to you know, further, I guess, stabilize your deposit base? Because we know there's a lot of, they, I think they call it sometimes hot money, where people who move their money around their savings to get the best rates they can online? Well, that's interesting, Ted. We had uh, launched this maybe four years ago. We were one of the first regional banks to actually launch uh, online online offering uh, into all 50 states uh, around the country. Um, and uh, we grew that initially to about six billion. Then when the pandemic came and the government flooded the market with liquidity, we actually ran it back down to four billion. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't need as many deposits. We have it now back up to eight billion. So it's really just to us another tool in the tool toolkit. There's certainly uh, certain investors with bigger balances tend to be more rate conscious. And so we have an offering to make sure those funds either come to citizens or stay in the house. 
So I also want to ask you, before we get off of First Republic and everything, there's a, there's a different angle to that for citizens, which is you actually tried to, you put in a bid for First Republic, um, and you lost out to J.P. Morgan Chase, the biggest bank in the country. I read some grumbling from some folks, I'll say from you, but from others saying the federal authorities were kind of just letting the rich get richer. J.P. Morgan isn't exactly small and hurting for mm-hmm. growth uh, as a bank, and yet they now got even bigger with First Republic. Were you frustrated that the authorities didn't see that as an opportunity to let, whether it was you or one of your regional competitors, uh, get bigger to give a little more competition to the really, really, really big banks? Yeah, well, I'm not really because uh, the mandate for the FDIC, the Deposit Insurance Fund, is to go with the bid uh, that is the least cost to the industry. Uh, people think that this is uh, going to cost the taxpayer money. It actually is self-insured by the banks. We pay deposit insurance, and then when a bank goes down, we have to make up that shortfall and replenish uh, the cost of that. So uh, J.P. Morgan, because of their gargantuan size, <laughs> can sharpen their pencil a little bit and uh, push the regionals uh, off to the loser circle uh, in that bidding. However, uh, the story doesn't end there. What was interesting is uh, you know, a lot of the folks who worked at First Republic uh, knew who the other competitors were, ourselves, PNC, uh, for example, with J.P. Morgan and have uh, you know, become free agents when the deal gets signed and they can decide if they want to work at J.P. Morgan or work someplace else. Uh, and we've had 50 of their senior uh, private bankers and uh, a, a big number of support people decide to come to Citizens. And so we've announced that about a month ago that uh, we picked up teams in Boston and New York and Florida and three teams in California. So it really gives a boost to our wealth business. So while we didn't win the whole bank and the balance sheet, we won a fair, fairly good chunk of the talent. So do you see long term, do you think there is a place, for, there will continue to be a place for the large but regional bank like a citizens versus, you know, it does sometimes feel like things are moving toward we're going to have little credit unions and B of A versus J.P. Morgan Chase fighting it out street by street across the country. I mean, do you think it's sustainable long term to also have strong, big, mid-sized banks? Yeah, I I think it is. And uh, I think we can uh, we need to focus and prioritize where we play and we need to be excellent in the things that we do. Uh, But uh, if you look at how we compete against the mega banks every day, uh, we're going up against uh, J.P.M. and B of A and Wells Fargo and all the big cities that we serve from a consumer and small business standpoint and from a corporate banking standpoint, we can uh, go toe to toe in the middle market and win business against those guys and they come into our deals. It's not just us going into their deals. So uh, I feel that uh, you know, that uh, is sustainable if we continue to execute well. We'll have to wait and see what some of the new regulatory changes are. That could be more of a burden on banks our size and kind of uh, initiate uh, the desire for more scale. Uh, but at this point, uh, I think we're at a great size, $223 billion. Uh, so we can uh, actually absorb the kind of higher costs of technology and going digital and uh, et cetera, uh, better than the smaller banks. But we're also able to deliver more value and thought leadership and advice to our customers than a gargantuan institution. So. Yeah, because it, consumers, they're expecting the, the online banking they might get from a J.P. Morgan Chase or a, a B of A, not just from you, but from like their local credit right. union, right? Which is, right. And it's expensive to provide, that's as right. I understand it. Yeah. So I think that's probably where the bigger burden ends up is at the smaller end of the spectrum. I think we probably have enough scale mm. uh, to continue to stay competitive. You, you know, uh, I'm not a finance or business reporter like my colleague here, so I have to do more homework for when we have a guest like you on the show. And uh, I was reading on this this topic that Ted was just asking about, a, a CNBC report, uh, where they said, quote, rising interest rates, losses on commercial real estate, and heightened regulatory scrutiny will pressure regional and mid-sized banks, leading to a wave of mergers. They go on to say half the country's banks will likely be swallowed by competitors in the next decade. Sounds like you might not agree with that assessment. Yeah, well, you know, the number of banks that are um, over 100 billion uh, is fairly small. So it's maybe 25 banks. Uh, There's 4,500 banks in the country. So there's a lot of community banks and banks, you know, from 5 billion to 50 billion. And so uh, what you've seen over time has been 
massive consolidation. If you go back 20 years ago, there were like 15,000 banks in mm. the country. It's down below five. So I think is it, that, is it, is it Trump yeah, that much? Really Fifteen thousand to five over, wow. over a long time. In citizens is in the teens, right? When you look at the the ranking and yeah, size we're of 12, banks, 13, okay. uh, roughly in size. And so, uh, you know, I think the trend where where was that consolidation? It was really more at the smaller end. And so I think that's what you'll continue to see. Uh, and you know whether there's more MOEs in the regional space. We had a big one about five years ago, which was BB and T and SunTrust merged. Uh, and so they got a lot bigger. They're over 500 billion today. Whether other banks are sized to side, you know, to be even more competitive, we should move up uh, into that weight class remains to be seen. You know, um, people around here know Citizens very well. It's a very strong brand in this region, very strong brand in Boston. It's been an established brand down in Philadelphia. I could not help but notice that Citizens is sponsoring the New York Giants and the New <laughs> Jersey Devils. Bruce, um, but New York Marathon. Uh, <laughs> well, so it, it said to me that you you're trying to uh, or citizens is trying to really uh, increase its footprint in the New York metro area. Is that yeah. correct? Well, what was interesting to us uh, back to, at the point of the IPO is that we loved our footprint back in our, 14, right? Yeah, 2014. Yeah. Good homework. Uh, but we had uh, a New England franchise and a an Mid-Atlantic franchise, and we had kind of a hole in the donut, which was the New York metro region. So if you want to be a strong Northeast bank, you kind of have to, to figure out how to get into New York. Uh, and the opportunity presented itself a couple of years back when we could buy HSBC's East Coast branches. They were exiting the retail business in the U.S., and we combined that with an acquisition of a bank called Investors Bank uh, in New Jersey, northern New Jersey. That gave us 200 branches in New York Metro, almost a million new customers, uh, and uh, an opportunity to really make our mark in New York. So if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> we, do it, we do a great job in Boston, in Providence, in Pittsburgh, in our other cities. We go up against uh, all the big competitors. New York's fiercely competitive. Mm. Uh, it's an expensive market to do business in, but I'm happy to report that we're doing a great job. We're hitting all our metrics and even exceeding them in terms of kind of customer count and deepening with their existing customers because we can do more for those customers than the predecessor banks could. We're getting up toward a break, so uh, we'll, we'll save the recession questions for the back half, but I had a, two other questions on like new stuff in banking that you guys are doing that I find interesting. One of them, uh, people might have noticed if they have a citizen's account, you're now offering early pay where someone's paycheck actually hits their account early. I was actually just kind of curious how that works. Are you assuming if someone gets paid about the same amount every two weeks that you know it's coming? Or is it like, you know, ADP or whoever has already told you what's going to yeah, come? We and know, we, you know, I think this is a real benefit to customers is if they're a regular customer of ours and we know what they're going to get paid on Friday, uh, we can advance the money in effect on uh, Wednesday. So we get them uh, payday a couple days early. Uh, and uh, it's a real convenience and a benefit to folks. We've really worked hard to try to benefit the consumer. We've uh, done a lot of other things on service charges. We don't have NSF charges anymore. Uh, we allow something uh, uh, called a, uh, it's effectively a 24 hour grace period uh, on overdrafts. So if you, if you overdraft your account, if, as long as you put the money back in your account, you won't incur an overdraft fee. So, so not looking uh, to kind of nickel and dime like, ha, we caught yeah, you with no, that 12-hour so, window. So you want to build these uh, strong, long-lasting relationships where you're working for the benefit of your customer. So uh, we've made a lot of those changes and we've seen our uh, overall customer satisfaction, our net promoter scores, we me measure that in JD Power. Uh, back in the time of the IPO, I think we were 20 of 23. Uh, today, uh, we cracked the top 10, we're number eight. Uh, so we've made a lot of progress there uh, with the improved customer experience, better digital tools, and then also these more customer-friendly policies we put in place. Bruce, we have to go to a break, but before we do, you know, less than a minute, um, you've been at the helm of Citizens Financial Group now for a decade, 2013, you started there. How much longer do you see yourself at Citizens? Uh, you know, I enjoy what I do uh, all the time. I serve at the pleasure of the board, but right. certainly as we're going through this choppy period, uh, I want to make sure that we land at the you know other side of the river and everything's going well before I make a determination to, to retire. All right, Bruce Van Son, uh, Chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group is our guest. When we come back, Ted mentioned the R word, recession, and we'll look at the housing market. Stay with us, you're watching Newsmakers.
Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Bruce Van Son. He is the chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group. Ted. So we alluded to it already. Let's talk about the economy. Um, so many gloomy predictions for over a year now about a recession is coming, a recession is coming, a recession is coming. But the economy refuses to follow the predictions and it's shown some residual strength. What do your economists right now think is going to happen since so far it seems like the consumer is stronger yeah. than we thought? Well, I, I will take uh, a little credit uh, for our own prognosis was that we didn't really see that there'd be a, a, a kind of even severe recession or moderate recession. We thought that we'd just see a gross slowdown. And if we had a recession, it would be kind of very short and shallow. Uh, I still think that's the call. Actually, you could argue that given the strength of the labor market, uh, the individual consumers not stretched. Uh, so uh, household balance sheets are in good shape. And most corporates did a nice job of extending their debt maturities during the pandemic and are still cash flowing reasonably well and have figured out how to deal with supply chain shortages, war for talent, inflation, et cetera. So we don't see other than kind of commercial real estate uh, and the office sector because of return to work trends, we don't see a lot of uh, uh, credit issues building up either. So. If you have that backdrop, it's rare that you would see a significant recession. I think uh, my hope is that the Fed kind of, if they go one more time, then they're done mm. because that could spark. Uh, that was that, my next that question. Could yeah. change the equation. Right. Are they going to say, uh, well, wait, we wanted the economy to slow more than this. We well, got to jack up rates you know, even It further. takes a while. Like monetary policy works with a lag. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to bring inflation down. You're seeing it come down slowly. You're also seeing banks pulling back a little bit and being more cautious. That's almost equivalent to another one or two hikes. So I think it was smart for the Fed to pause and wait and see and get some more data. I think they're hell bent on doing one more hike and then uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that's it. Uh, we'll see. Um, one of the impacts, of course, on, on raising the rates is um, mortgage rates rise. And last check, mortgage rates were in the, you know, depending on what institution, it's in the 7% yep. range. Um, you know, conventional wisdom is that when mortgage rates go up, home prices fall because it's more expensive. But that's not really happening right now, particularly in the Northeast. Why do you think that is? Part of that is just really a, a supply uh, challenge. So there's there's less, fewer homes are being built. Uh, so you're seeing less new construction. Uh, and uh, there's a myriad of factors for that. But uh, I think, you know, the, the, the value of homes has continued to stay pretty stable, which is a good thing since most people, that's their principal asset. Uh, it's tougher for the people at the bottom of the ladder who are trying to buy their first homes because uh, there's limited supply, the prices are high, and the cost of finance is high. So that's resulted in a pretty big slowdown in terms of kind of new purchases. And the mortgage market is kind of quite a bit off where it had been uh, even pre-pandemic. Uh, that ultimately, I think, will find an equilibrium when the Fed starts to bring rates down. That should uh, some of the supply chain issues lessen. Uh, but I think we're in, in for this kind of a housing market for a while, certainly <laughs> through the balance of this year and well into next year. Well, and especially <coughs> Citizens Vantage Point as the biggest bank in New England in the Northeast, which is particularly loath to build much more right. new housing. I mean, I, I just look out and wonder if we could be in this sort of barring, hopefully, any big recession where people don't have any money, you know. I know a lot of people my own age, I'm an older millennial, who still are trying to find the house that yep. they need because there isn't supply coming online, prices remain high, et cetera. Um, you know, is the Northeast going to maybe be in this permanently high situation until there's a really big slowdown just because there's not much, at least the our part of the Northeast, Eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island? Yeah, I, I, it's hard to say. I mean, I think multifamily has been strong, so so the rental market continues to be strong whether some of that moves uh, over to condos or whether some office that's redundant can mm. be converted uh, over to condos. I think you'll see that kind of uh, uh, alternative to the single family dwellings, which are harder to construct given some of the space uh, considerations. And you mentioned commercial real estate. That's, uh, you've had to talk about it a lot on your investor calls this year. I've seen concerns among some of the analysts who follow citizens. Um, you know, how worried are you about that some of these trends are pretty permanent and you have a portfolio with some offices that those landlords are going to have trouble getting the people they thought they would before the pandemic? Yeah, I'd say that, the, you know, all commercial real estate isn't uh, created equal. So location matters and then quality matters. And so when we talk about our uh, commercial real estate portfolio, we 
I uh, like to highlight that about uh, two thirds of it is suburban as opposed to central business district. That has been less affected in general by return to office trends. Uh, and then, you know, over two thirds is class A. Uh, and, you know, the office is categorized A, B, and C. So we have relatively less exposure to B and C. And we've really focused on having good sponsors and good uh, uh, borrowers to uh, be our counterparties. And so we have a track record with them and they tend to kind of choose good properties, run the properties well and stand by their investments. So uh, I think there'll be, you know, certainly a fair number of workouts where uh, the, you know, the borrower has to put in additional equity and the bank's willing to extend the loan and then kind of play for time and wait for the market to solidify. I think that's the way most of the banks will work their way through this. Bruce, I have to ask you about this. Earlier this month, the Santander Bank branch on Federal Hill was the victim of a heist, uh, roughly $500,000 in cash was taken in what police have called a sophisticated robbery. They were in and out in three minutes getting access to the bank vault. Look, banks have been the target of a crime since their inception uh, for obvious reasons. When you hear about a crime like this one, what's, what's your first thought? Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of concern for the safety of the colleagues that are working in the branch. Um, and so uh, we've looked into a way to fortify uh, without spooking our customers, but making it safer. So we have private uh, guards in some of the locations that are potentially in tougher areas. So uh, that's you know, your number one concern. But what I would say is there's a lot more crime that's happening uh, through uh, the cybersecurity, through the internet, yes, right. than, than physical holdups. I had hold a question ups. about that. So it's that's, not as that's, exciting. That's, well, yeah. go, go ahead well, and pivot but, there. But, but, you know, that's, uh, we, we've seen an explosion in many mm. uh, kinds of uh, cyber crimes uh, and some old-fashioned new uh, variants, such as uh, check washing. So people are, are pilfering uh, bills that are paid in the mail and uh, you know, kind of writing over the check and doing it in a very sophisticated way and then trying to present the check for payment to a different payee than mm. the intended payee. So uh, there's no shortage of clever, diabolical people out there who are trying to enrich themselves in illicit ways. But uh, the good news from our standpoint is you know, we certainly uh, put this at the top of the list, safeguarding customer assets, customer information. We've had huge investment. It goes right to the top of our capital expenditures list every year. Uh, the new tools to keep the, uh, to keep the bank safe and keep our customers safe. And we've got great people uh, in, that, in that area of the bank as well. We talked earlier about Citizens Access, your high yield online account, but I, I did look yesterday and your traditional old fashioned savings accounts were only offering 0.07% or 0.01%. And it's an issue that's caught the attention, not just with you, with all the banks, of U.S. Senator Jack Reed, who's on the banking committee. I want you to listen to what he had to say here on Newsmakers a couple of weeks ago and get your reaction. The banking industry has been not only enjoying good profits, but also they are, at moments of crisis, have been supported by taxpayers, by ordinary Americans. And in their plans, I think they should uh, reasonably pay you know, good deposits. But their argument would be well, it's a market. And if, you know, to attract deposits, we raise rates. If we don't have to do that, et cetera. But I think it's something that, that people should be aware of. What's your reaction, Reed, kind of job owning you into higher rates? Uh, well, you know, I have the ultimate respect for Senator Reed. Uh, I think he's served the state so well for so many years. Uh, I would slightly disagree with his position on this. And, uh, Ted, it's a, it's a continuum of products that we offer. So there's, you know, checking and then checking with interest that has those low rates that you're talking about. Those are more transactional balances um, and, and you don't pay typically much interest on that. But then we offer savings uh, and money products that are approaching where we are with, uh, with the citizens access rates. So there, you could get a money market account at citizens for 4%. Uh, those are new money offers generally. But uh, anyway, I think, I think it's highly competitive. Uh, as I said, over 4,500 banks in the country. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think there's uh, uh, any, any kind of collective uh, collusion on the parts of banks to suppress the rates. It's just, you know, certain products uh, allow you relative access to your money and you're not going to pay 
uh, an interest rate on that, but you're getting lots of services for that. You're getting all the payment capabilities and advice from the bank, et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of have to look at the full extent of the equation. It's not just interest rate paid. It's, uh, it's everything that we're doing on behalf of the customers. We have about one minute left uh, here, Bruce. So uh, briefly, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Citizens has a fairly shiny new facility up in, in Johnston now, and they could open in 2018. Um, the recession, people work from home. What, do you, what are you seeing in Johnston? Are people back to work uh, now, or is, is there still a lot of work from home? Yeah, no, about it's, 30 uh, seconds we're, we're pulling people back in, and uh, most of the folks in Johnston are working on a, a three-day minimum uh, hybrid arrangement. So three days in, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, and uh, we're approaching kind of attendance levels that the, where we were in 18 and 19 pre-pandemic. So that's really great to see. I think it really makes a difference if you've got people in and they're collaborating and we can About sustain our culture and uh, mentor young people. And then we have the beautiful sports facilities, which by the way, Johnston Little League is using and Johnston Football uh, <laughs> is using. So uh, it's been great. Go, go check that out. Bruce Van Zandt from Citizens, thanks so much. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.